Welcome to SNC's podcast series, SNC Critical Insights. My name is Judd Littleton, and I'm a partner in the litigation group and co head of the firm's Supreme Court and Appellate Practice. I'm here with Julia Malkina, also a partner in the litigation group and member of the Supreme Court and Appellate Practice. Today, we are continuing our series of podcast episodes supplementing SNC's Supreme Court Business Review, our summary of the decisions from this past term that are most relevant to businesses. You can find the Supreme Court Business Review, as well as all of our podcast episodes once they're released, on SNC's website at www.sulcrom.com. In this episode, we are joined by Bill Monahan, the head of SNC's Product Liability and Mass Torts Group. We are delighted to have Bill with us to discuss the Supreme Court's recent decisions in Ford Motor Company versus Montana 8th Judicial District Court and TransUnion LLC versus Ramirez. And we are especially glad to have Bill share his insights on the implications of those decisions for businesses and practitioners alike. So let's start with the court's decision in Ford. The case was the latest in a series of decisions where the court has been trying, with limited success, some might say, to give litigants clear guidance on when state courts can exercise jurisdiction over defendants residing or headquartered in other states. Here, the question was whether state courts properly exercised personal jurisdiction over Ford in two product liability lawsuits arising out of car accidents that occurred in the states where each of the plaintiffs lived, but where Ford had manufactured and initially sold those vehicles in other states. Ford was a consolidated decision resolving two separate cases from state courts in Montana and Minnesota. In each case, the plaintiff was injured in their home state, but the Ford vehicles at issue were originally manufactured in other states. The vehicles were also sold to other individuals, not the plaintiffs here, in those other individuals' home states. Ford argued that the courts didn't have specific jurisdiction over it because Ford neither sold nor designed the specific vehicles at issue in either Montana or Minnesota. Ford conceded purposeful availment, the first prong of the two-prong test for the minimum context analysis courts applied to determine whether they have specific jurisdiction. But Ford argued that its contacts with Montana and Minnesota could not satisfy the second prong of the analysis because Ford's contacts did not arise out of or relate to the plaintiff's injuries. That is because, Ford argued, the vehicles at issue were not originally sold or manufactured in Montana or Minnesota. In essence, Ford argued that its contacts with Montana and Minnesota, although they were plentiful, could not be the but-for cause of the plaintiff's injuries because the vehicles at issue were not sold, manufactured, or designed in those states. Both the Montana Supreme Court and the Minnesota Supreme Court rejected Ford's arguments. And in this decision, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed, concluding that Ford was subject to specific personal jurisdiction in both lawsuits. The court, in an opinion by Justice Kagan, held that, quote, when a company like Ford serves a market for a product in a state and that product causes injury in the state to one of its residents, the state's courts may entertain the resulting suit, end quote. Justice Kagan began the minimum context analysis by noting that Ford agreed that it had purposely availed itself of the privilege of conducting business in Minnesota and Montana, explaining that it was, quote, no small wonder that Ford had conceded this prong in the minimum context analysis. Justice Kagan described Ford's truckload, tongue in cheek, of contacts with both states. As she put it, Ford, by every means imaginable, among them billboards, TV and radio spots, print ads, and direct mail, urges the residents of the forum states to buy its vehicles. Justice Kagan also noted that Ford works hard to foster ongoing connections to its car's owners, including by regularly maintaining and repairing Ford cars. Turning to the next prong of the minimum contacts analysis, the requirement that the lawsuit, quote, arise out of or relate to the defendant's in-state conduct, Justice Kagan took on Ford's argument that but-for causation was required to satisfy that prong. 
Justice Kagan noted that the phrase arise out of or relate to is disjunctive and thus contemplates that some relationships between the plaintiff's claims and the defendant's conduct will support jurisdiction without a causal showing. Justice Kagan then explained that Ford's extensive in-state activities, including the marketing and sale of the same models of vehicles that the plaintiffs purchased and the post-sale maintenance and repair services Ford offers to all customers, were sufficiently related to the product liability claims the plaintiffs were bringing here. As a result, Justice Kagan found that Ford's activities in Minnesota and Montana were close enough to support jurisdiction. Interestingly, Justices Alito, Gorsuch, and Thomas concurred in the result, but did not join the court's opinion. Justice Alito filed an opinion concurring in the judgment, and Justice Gorsuch also filed a separate opinion concurring in the judgment, in which Justice Thomas joined. All three justices would have found that Ford was subject to specific personal jurisdiction, but reasoned that a new framework for personal jurisdiction might be necessary for the 21st century, given the jurisdictional challenges posed by an ever-evolving global economy. So with that overview of the decision, let's turn to our expert here. Bill, do you think Ford represents a sea change in the law of specific personal jurisdiction? I don't think so. It's important to keep in mind that this decision is exclusively focused on the second prong of the minimum contacts analysis, namely the arises out of or relates to prong. As Julia noted earlier, Ford conceded purposeful availment, but argued that its extensive contacts with Minnesota and Montana were essentially irrelevant since they were not the cause of plaintiff's injuries. The court rejected this argument and stated that it had never held that a but-for causation test was required to satisfy the arises out of or relates to prong. Prior to this case, this but-for argument had gained some traction in at least some lower courts. But while the Supreme Court made clear that but-for causation was not the standard, it did not provide much guidance as to what exactly does satisfy the arises out of or relates to prong, except here, Ford's conduct plainly met it. So, Bill, does this decision impact the purposeful availment analysis at all? Uh, I don't think it does. Ford conceded purposeful availment, so that prong of the test was not before the court. There are a number of questions about purposeful availment left open by the plurality decisions in Asahi and McIntyre but those questions were not addressed in this Ford decision. So, Bill, do you think this decision is going to have any implications for foreign manufacturers? Ford is a U.S.-based manufacturer and distributor, and Ford extensively marketed and sold these trucks in the relevant states. They conceded that as part of the briefing. Thus, as Justice Kagan remarked, it wasn't surprising that Ford conceded it. But That fact pattern isn't going to exist for non-U.S. manufacturers who generally do not directly market and sell products in the U.S., but instead do so only through U.S.-based subsidiary distributors. It's unclear how Ford might apply, if at all, to a case where a foreign manufacturer utilizes a U.S.-based subsidiary or distributor and does not concede purposeful availment. While I don't believe this decision will have much impact on non-U.S. manufacturers who do business in the U.S. only through their subsidiaries, we'll have to see how the lower courts respond to attempts by the plaintiff's bar to expand the reach of Ford to apply to non-U.S. manufacturers acting through their subsidiaries. What do you think about Justice Gorsuch's and Justice Alito's opinions concurring in the judgment? How might they implicate where the law of personal jurisdiction is going? I thought their concurrences made sense. Justice Gorsuch points out that the doctrinal framework of personal jurisdiction that originates from the early 20th and late 19th centuries may not have the same resonance in our global economy. Clearly, the way in which the world does business today has evolved dramatically since the last 75 years. And I I think they simply point out that the law of personal jurisdiction may have to find a way to catch up in that regard. But how exactly it's going to catch up, that remains to be seen. Well, I'll just have to stay tuned. Thank you for that, Bill. 
Let's move on to the Supreme Court's decision in TransUnion LLC versus Ramirez. On June 25th, the Supreme Court held that some, but not all, members of a class had standing to bring claims under the Fair Credit Reporting Act against TransUnion, one of the big three credit reporting agencies, for failing to use reasonable procedures to ensure the accuracy of consumer credit files. Judd, do you want to give us some background? Sure, happy to. So in the early 2000s, TransUnion introduced a new feature to its credit reporting services that would flag whether a consumer's name appeared on a list published by the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFAC, of individuals who are deemed a threat to national security. Generally speaking, it's illegal for businesses to transact with people who are named on this list. And this feature worked by comparing consumers' first and last names to the names on the OFAC list. Unfortunately, many consumers shared a name with individuals on the OFAC list and were therefore inadvertently flagged by this feature. That's what happened to the named plaintiff, in this case, Sergio Ramirez, who was prevented from buying a car because of a false positive OFAC alert on his TransUnion credit report. Mr. Ramirez filed a class action complaint against TransUnion on behalf of all consumers who were notified by TransUnion that their name matched an individual on the OFAC list. TransUnion opposed certification of the class on a number of grounds, including by arguing that a substantial majority of the purported class, unlike Mr. Ramirez, had never had a misleading OFAC alert shared with a third party. In total, only about 1,800 of the more than 8,000 purported class members had had an alert disclosed to a third party. Nevertheless, a federal district court in Northern California certified the class, and after a jury verdict in the consumer's favor, the Ninth Circuit agreed that the class had been appropriately certified. Supreme Court reversed, holding that the entire class did not have Article III standing to pursue claims against TransUnion. In a 5-4 opinion, Written by Justice Kavanaugh, the court concluded that the majority of class members who never had an OFAC alert disclosed to third parties did not suffer a concrete harm and therefore lacked standing. And so holding, the court made clear that a statutory violation alone cannot support Article III standing. Rather, plaintiffs must show a concrete injury separate and apart from the statutory violation. The court explained that Article III requires an injury that has a close relationship to a harm traditionally recognized as providing a basis for a lawsuit in American courts, such as physical and monetary harm or cognizable and tangible harms like reputational harm. Four members of the court dissented, Justices Thomas, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. So a somewhat unusual combination of dissenting justices with Justice Thomas joining three of the more liberal members of the court. And in his dissenting opinion, Justice Thomas, joined by the other three justices, argued that the court's decision was novel in declaring that legal injury is inherently insufficient to support standing. In particular, Justice Thomas disagreed with the court's conclusion that the legislature lacks the ability to create and define enforceable legal rights, regardless of whether those rights, quote, deviate too far from their common law roots. That overview, let's get into some questions for Bill. Bill, jumping off of the dissent, is the court's opinion in TransUnion a novel approach to the question of Article Three standing? At least from my perspective, the court's opinion reflects the application to these particular facts of a well-established principle of Article III standing. No concrete harm, no standing. In TransUnion, there was no evidence of concrete harm to the vast majority of class members, no physical injury, no monetary injury, no reputational injury, nothing concrete, and so they lacked standing. That holding is consistent with the court's opinion in Spokio v. Robbins, which held that Article III standing requires a concrete injury, even in the context of a statutory violation, and that the general purpose of Article III standing is to ensure that claims raise a real controversy with real impact on real persons, not hypothetical harms that could have, but never actually manifested. So I think TransUnion reinforces some of the standing principles the court had previously announced. 
And what do you see as the importance of the court's decision for Article Three standing questions as a general matter? I think there are at least two important takeaways from this opinion. First, the court held that all plaintiffs, including unnamed members of a purported class, must demonstrate that they meet Article III's standing requirements. Second, the Supreme Court clarified that the risk of future harm alone is insufficient to establish a concrete injury. Rather, plaintiffs, including unnamed class members, will need to demonstrate that the harm materialized or that they were independently harmed by the risk of the harm materializing. So how will these points impact the Article Three standing analysis in class action cases? I think the transunion decision will have a significant effect on the size of putative classes going forward. For example, in products liability cases, consumers who bought an allegedly defective product but never actually experienced physical or monetary harm, they may not be able to establish standing. Earlier, we spoke about the Ford case. Just using that case as an example, the, the two plaintiffs in that case claimed that they were both injured in car accidents as a result of alleged malfunctions with their cars. But consumers who purchased the same model Ford cars and never experienced those alleged malfunctions may not have standing to sue Ford despite the risk of malfunction. Simply owning the same product or having the risk that the malfunction may occur sometime in the future should likely be insufficient to establish standing under TransUnion. Sounds right to me. I- I noticed that the court expressly chose not to address whether every class member must demonstrate standing before class certification, as the decision here came up on an appeal after a trial and final judgment. So what's your take on that question, Bill? So the question remains open after this decision. But where does it stand now? There has been some disagreement among the circuit courts on this issue, but In light of TransUnion and its clear holding that all members of the class need to establish standing, I think courts may be more willing to address challenges to Article III standing at the class certification stage now. At class certification, the named plaintiff's injuries have to be reflective of the injuries suffered by absent class members. And in order to answer that question, courts should have to assess whether absent class members have standing at all. Moreover, at class certification, which in most cases is going to happen after discovery, plaintiffs may need to support standing with evidence as opposed to mere allegations that all class members were actually injured. Thanks very much for your insights, Bill. That's all we have for today. Thank you all for listening to SNC's Critical Insights. For more information about our practice, please visit us on the web at www.soulcrom.com. Please also join Judd, me, and our guests for upcoming episodes of our Supreme Court Business Review podcast series. Mm-hmm.